The reason actually we get very excited about talking about clock is not just really making time, but it really about exploring the frontier problems of quantum physics. Clock is, I feel, one part of that human endeavor. You can actually turn that into a you know, quantum physics playground. Inside this basement lab, a team of physicists are wrangling atoms at super high speeds and suspending them in optical traps to measure atomic ticks. When you walk into our lab, the first thing come to your mind is like, oh man, that's crazy. On this tabletop, Jun Yi and his team at Jilla have built the world's most precise atomic clock, and it gets its ticks from the vibrations of 10,000 atoms. Time is a universal constant in our lives. GPS navigation, power grids, financial networks, whether you get to work before your boss, all of this depends on reliable timekeeping. But have you ever stopped to think about what time actually is? It's a very precise measurement of ticks. And thanks to the march of technological progress, that tick has gone from the movement of the sun to a pendulum swing to the vibrations of a quartz crystal. And ever since the 1960s, we've been on atomic time. Inside an atom, electrons moving around nucleus, and that has a very periodic oscillation. And we say we want to use that as our fundamental unit of time. We want to measure those energy level structure extremely precisely, because that's a constant of nature. So if we can measure something extremely precisely, it should be a universal value. And that's what the atomic clock is all about. This is the NIST F2, an atomic clock at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Colorado. It's one of the world's master clocks and is designed to measure the very specific oscillations of cesium, a silvery element on the periodic table. Inside it, a gas of cesium atoms enter the clock's vacuum chamber. Microwave laser beams push the cesium atoms together into a ball. The lasers toss the ball up, then it falls back down, emitting photons. The time it takes for the cesium ball to move between two different energy levels is 9,192,631,770 cycles. And that is the definition of a second. That sounds pretty precise, but a new generation of atomic clocks are on the horizon, which use laser light instead of microwaves to divide time into even finer slices. The reason why we want to move from microwave to optical frequency is given by one simple fact. The light frequency oscillates much faster than the microwave. At a blink of eye, uh, you can have a million billion cycles go by if you are dealing with optical frequencies. While if you are dealing with microwave frequencies, you might be dealing with only one billion cycles per second. The more cycles you can measure per fixed time, the less fractional mistakes you will be making. Creating an optical clock is an incredible challenge. And while this looks like a labyrinth of wires, everything has a purpose. It's like if you're a little, if we can shrink your size down <laughs> by a factor of 10, and you walk along those mirrors, it would be like complete black forest of mirrors. Every single mirror on that table has its own useful purpose, which is allowing us to steer all kinds of colorful lasers to interact with the strontium atom. Instead of cesium, Yi and other teams at the NIST are building optical clocks based on other elements, like strontium and ytterbium, that can tick at higher frequencies. Strontium sits at the second column of the periodic table and it's, uh, it's characterized with two valence electrons. When you have one electron, it's very volatile. When you have two, it's much less volatile compared to, say, cesium atoms. The strontium atom, when you liberate it, they are moving with a speed of a few hundred meters per second, which is essentially like a bullet train. And so if I ask, what time is it, strontium atom? Then I wouldn't be able to tell you the time. So the first thing we need to do is slowing them down so that they are standing still in front of you. So we need a bunch of lasers. We take a few tens of milliseconds to finally prepare them into a very, very low temperatures. Then we load them into an optical trap. How we do that is by using another laser, almost like a, a tweezer made of light. So this laser light coming from outside of the vacuum window focuses its light down to a, a, to a little focus spot and polarize the atom and hold them in the middle of the vacuum chamber so you can actually look at it. Yi's team was able to cool the strontium atoms to below a microkelvin, turning it into a quantum gas that allowed the atoms to organize into an optical lattice. So once the atom is being cooled down and trapped, then you need to turn on your clock laser, finally try to match your laser color to the transition of the atom that you're trying to interrogate as a clock signal. 
The tick for this 3D gas clock is the exact frequency that prompts the strontium atoms to switch energy levels, which is 430 trillion cycles per second. It's so precise that it can keep time without losing or gaining a second for 15 billion years. We all know that these optical atomic clocks are now performing 100 times better than the microwave clock. Time is something that's it's being discussed very actively right now. When will be the good time to replace the current cesium clock with the strontium clock or for some other atom? Defining time is a human enterprise. It requires international cooperation. It requires a universal time where every country should agree upon. And so this is a really a very serious matter. But Yi's pursuit in making an ultra-precise atomic clock isn't just about refining the standard of time. Because atomic clocks are measuring the interplay between electrons and elementary particles, they are a unique tool to investigate why our universe is the way it is. You're building more precise uh, and more sensitive scientific instruments to be able to detect gravitational waves or detect the presence of dark matter. Because in the end, if you are the master of the space-time fabric, you got to be able to figure out, you know, the dark matter is bending the space-time a little bit. And the one way to figure this out is just measure time. There's a symphony going on. Uh, and uh, time, remember, is not something unique. Time is related to space. So if there are all kinds of bodies moving around, merging, uh, separating, rebirth, and so on, the time is changing everywhere. If you build clocks so well, eventually you'll get to the point where you will not help but hear all these microscopic noise that's going on in the universe. I'm optimistic uh, within the next 30 years, we might actually get to the point where we can measure the gravitational effect on quantum physics. And maybe it will keep going you know, until to the point where the universe says, guys, you know, all the times are different <laughs> and here's the, the final limit. For more science documentaries, check out this one right here. Don't forget to subscribe and keep coming back to Seeker for more videos.